Are you ready to learn? Because my super experienced guests are ready to share some really valuable information. Make sure and listen all the way to the end to get help and support. So let's start with the best audio experience. Hello, guys. Welcome. Welcome to our show. Today we discuss about effective marketing, science and magic, how you can provide marketing campaigns to get high results. It's so important today because generic marketing doesn't work anymore. Uh, I remember 10 years ago, I uh, created all marketing campaigns with generic methods that worked well, but things changed because of competition. So many competitors online. So you need to customize your uh, marketing uh, preferences, search for buying persona, many other stuff. So we are going to discuss this topic with Ethan Decker. How are you? I am very good, Anatoly. How are you? Um, I'm doing great. Yeah, I, you know, we discuss a little bit. It's Friday. I love this day. You know, I love this day from school. Uh, it doesn't mean that I hate Monday. I love Monday as well. But, you know, on Friday, we have special feeling because of this weekend. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, before we, uh, we start, tell more about yourself, experience, background, and tell why you have so many books on your background. Well, this is, this is all fake. None of these books are real. I don't, I don't read any books. Uh, I'm just kidding. Those, uh, those are indeed real books. Uh, it's kind of, of course, the standard background, but sometimes you get to add some things that other people don't have. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't think a lot of yeah. people have a uh, bear skulls in their, in their background. Um, mm -hmm. My background is a little weird. I started as a scientist and I fell ass backwards into marketing and advertising. And I've been doing that for 20 years now. Uh, so I focus mostly on the advertising and promotional and consumer side of things. But as a strategist and as a former scientist, I bring to it a lot of rigor, a lot of uh, more sophisticated analysis. But again, being in a creative world, I have to figure out how to marry those two things. So over the course of the past 20 years, what I've ultimately been able to figure out is a way to combine the science and the art, the, the magic and the rigor, uh, what I sometimes call the laws and the levers of marketing so that people can be much more effective in how they do marketing and advertising. Nice, nice. Let's talk about magic. I love this word. I know sometimes uh, when you provide something new, uh, super effective, clients can call it magic. But mm -hmm. it's more <laughs> related to experience, to uh, individual approach. Uh, and uh, can you tell how to uh, get effective uh, results with uh, marketing magic? <laughs> sure. I, I want to start with a metaphor. Because in, in advertising and marketing, you usually hear people from one side of the aisle or the other side of the aisle. Either people really believe it's a science and that you can measure your way to everything. You can test every element of marketing. And ultimately, we will have perfect knowledge of consumers and perfect ability to target them and market to them and know exactly how much their lifetime value is worth. On the other side of the aisle, you have people who are usually much more creative minded who say, oh, that's bullshit. You can't predict everything. You can't measure everything. And they talk, of course, about a lot of the, the brands that shoot out of nowhere and do things that seem to defy all of the scientific principles like Tesla or like Tito's Vodka. Tito's Vodka is the number one vodka in America right now. They were nothing 10 years ago. It's a mature market. It's a tasteless, odorless, colorless product. And yet now Tito's is the number one vodka in America. What did they do? They didn't just do science. They didn't just measure everything and do targeted marketing. There's magic involved. So in marketing, you do hear either people talking about the science and the measurements or talking about the magic. So my metaphor is a building. You, you need the science side to understand how to make a building that, for instance, does not fall in an earthquake. 
or even does not fall when you build it, that it's possible to build. But you need the magic side because the science doesn't tell you how to create a building that feels a certain way when you walk in, that that connects with the landscape in a poetic, beautiful way, that has a door that opens out to a, a backyard or a meadow and makes you feel a certain way. So you need the science of the engineering of a building, but you need the magic of an architect or a designer to, to do that human thing. And there's not just one way to do that, right? There are hundreds, if not thousands of ways to express a building in a beautiful way. It's the same with marketing. You need both. You need the science so that it doesn't fall down but you need the magic because you really can't measure and predict everything. It's too complex. Yeah, yeah I agree. You know, yeah, I, I love uh, reading some predictions about stock market, about crypto price, but you know, uh -huh. I, you know, I lost uh, many times, you know, <laughs> by taking these predictions, AI predictions, experts predictions, nobody knows no. in the end what actually will work. But I know exactly, you know, results depend on the right strategy. According to a few studies, uh, only 36% of all companies have a documented content strategy. Many of them use just generic methods. So they check out competitors, analyze how they get traffic, uh, sales, and do the same. I usually tell my clients uh, it's the wrong way to do the same. Uh, because competitors usually consider their strong sides, uh, their unique selling proposition. Uh, you have your unique selling proposition. And for example, if competitors are good with blog writing or YouTube or TikTok, it doesn't matter. Uh, they are good with that. It doesn't mean that we can replicate and to get this success. They have experience. And for me, it's more important to consider your strong side than uh, trying to... Uh, uh, take best practices. Can you tell how to create the right marketing strategy? Ah, uh, yes. That too is a mix of science and magic. A mm -hmm. And what I like to talk about is the paradox. There's a paradox, the brand category paradox, where you fit into a certain category. Let's say um, we were talking about vodka and you want people to know that what you sell is a vodka. Now, if you put it in a, a bottle that looks like a spray bottle, people are going to think it's Windex, that it's all surface cleaner. If you put it in a bottle that looks like hot sauce, people aren't going to know that it's vodka. So you need to do things that let people know that Tito's is vodka. By the way, I've never worked on Tito's. So just to be mm -hmm. clear, <laughs> I use examples from everywhere, not just the things I've worked on. On the other hand, you you do need, as you said, to do things that are different and that stand out. So it's a paradox because most people really don't want to think too much about your brand or your product. They want to get on with their life and they don't, they don't really care too much. Once in a while, they get interested in a fashion brand or a sports brand or a topic. Like if they're really into hot sauce, then you have someone who's crazy about hot sauce and he knows all about, or she knows all, all about hot sauce. But most people really don't care much. So to come up with a good marketing strategy, you do need to do some things, like I said, that's like the engineering of the house that every other brand in the category does. You need to deliver on the fundamental drivers of the category. If you make vodka, it needs to be tasteless, odorless, colorless, smooth, uh, a good price, whatever that is where you're competing. And it needs to be available to buy and the bottle can't leak. Right? You need to do some of the fundamentals. So you do have to copy or mimic what the category does. The hard part is finding the things that you can do uniquely or differently. I hate the word own. Like we're going to own smooth taste. You're not. There's no way really to own a category attribute, something that everybody else has to do. Like if you're a shoe brand, you can't own comfort because every shoe has to be more or less comfortable. But you can own unique things like Tito's owns its own name. Nobody else has the name Tito's. Or you can evoke things that no other brand is yet evoking in the market. For instance, uh, in America, some big brands of, of vodka are Stoli and uh, Smirnoff and Absolute 
and Belvedere, and these are all foreign brands. And so Tito's, they're very proud of the fact that they're made in America, that they're made in Texas, and that they're made in Austin, Texas. And there's no other big vodka brand that's famous for being Texas. And just by the fact that they are a Texas brand, you probably have associations with what that means. And it's mm -hmm. Tito's from Texas. Tito's from Texas suddenly feels really different than Absolute from Sweden. Or, you know, yeah. Soli from Russia. Sorry, it's my <laughs> terrible Russian accent. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, to come up with that strategy, you need to balance the things that the category requires with those things that are different or noticeable or that give you some kind of advantage. It's very hard. It's very hard. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, let's talk about Tito's. You mentioned that this brand appealed 10 years ago from scratch. As uh, all brands appeal uh, from scratch, you know, uh, nobody knows about brands, but in some time when they deserve and earn uh, strong brand recognition, yeah, it can grow. Uh, and can you tell how to compete with big brands? Let's talk about Tidas. Uh, many big brands like Smirnov, like Absolute, uh, name them. So uh, how to craft the strategy and take your customers uh, and take your piece of this pie because, uh, I mean, like in this overwhelming market. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So first of all, the research shows pretty clearly, this is some great research from uh, the Ehrenberg Bass Institute in Australia, that when uh, a small brand grows, it usually grows by stealing customers from other brands, stealing market share. Yeah. And that makes sense. When a big brand grows, like Smirnoff, they usually have to grow by expanding the market, by growing the entire category. And that makes intuitive sense if you think about it, because when you're a small brand, you don't really usually have the power to bring new people into the category and get new drinkers or new toothpaste users. But when you're a really big brand, you do have that power. So that's the first piece. You should assume you are stealing or borrowing people from other brands. And it, it is more of the case that you will be sharing them with those brands, not stealing them. Because people who start to drink Tito's don't all of a sudden stop drinking Stoli. They drink both. Uh, so that's the first thing. You will be sharing customers with all of these big brands. The second piece, which I like to say, and this is a bit of the magic part, how can you fight unfair? How can you fight in a way the other brands can't? What's one thing you can do? Tito's, for instance, they gave away a ton of vodka early on, and they did it at parties everywhere. And I think they could be looser. They could maybe skirt some of the rules about what, what kinds of parties they have to be associated with. They don't have a big legal department telling them that their brand safety is in danger because they're at a party where it's known to have some drugs or things like that. So what's something you can do as a small brand that the other brands are no longer allowed to do? For example, big brands usually can't curse. So if you can say shit and fuck in your marketing, and other brands can't, maybe that's an advantage. And maybe that allows you to relate in a real human way with people because big brands can't curse. So, right, you got those two things. You're going to be borrowing and sharing customers with the big guys, but you want to fight unfair. Find a thing you can do, any kind of marketing thing, that they just can't because their hands are tied and they're a big formal brand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great insights. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, for example, from my experience, it's hard to steal customers from big brands because uh, of customer loyalty. You know, uh, for example, many customers, uh, for, for example, uh, my company, we use some CRM tools. Uh, many others, uh, I mean, like many other great CRM tools are online, but it's hard to change habits, you know, by using one CRM tool, you know, because we have system, we have uh, clients there, we have the process. But if we take other mm -hmm. tool that probably good as well, even better, but it takes time to learn about this tool. It takes time 
to uh, set up your system so because of habits you know can you tell how to tell customers to change if they are loyal with some brands they're satisfied with the quality but give them a strong reason to uh, test your uh, yeah i understand uh, this brand uh, uh, shares for free vodka you know <laughs> i think uh -huh. many people will love it <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> and yeah. I, rem i remember when uber uh, uh, usually uh, takes new cities in the world uh, uh, uber pays for five first rights you now so uh, i remember in ukraine when uber appealed uh, i got this message you can uh, get five free rides in taxi so i use them i have my car i have everything but why not <laughs> if someone can drive me you know from a to b you know so yeah uh, can you tell many other tips how to do it how to steal customers uh, if they are loyal sure the well first of all you're right a lot of it is habit it's not necessarily loyalty in the sense of i love this brand or i am in love with this product it's just habit or it's 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 painful and annoying and uncomfortable to switch or you're just not sure what you're going to get there's a phrase the devil you know versus the devil that you don't know and so you stick with the devil that you do know. Uh, so the first big step, the first big step in getting someone to try your brand, either to switch to your brand or to start to use your brand with the others, is that they have to know of your brand at all and think of your brand at all. And mm -hmm. this gets to what is a misconception about a lot of advertising, especially, which is that people think advertising persuades people. Mostly it doesn't. Mostly, advertising reminds people that you even exist. Coca-Cola only has a 25% market share or something like that. Or I should, sorry, Coca-Cola only has like a 25% household penetration. So a lot of people don't drink Coke. So Coke has to remind people that they exist, even though we all think it's the biggest brand in the world. So that when you're thirsty and you want to pick up a case of soda for a party, that you're having on your back porch in Florida because it's a Friday and it's beautiful <laughs> and the birds are chirping, then yeah. you, you want to come to mind at all. And that is often one of the biggest barriers for a small brand is you're, you're unknown. Nobody even thinks of you. So the very first step is people need to at least think of you at all when they're thinking about a CRM product or a vodka or a soda. That's the first big yeah. step. And that's hard yeah. because we're distracted. We don't care. We're not constantly reading and researching CRM products or, or soda or vodka. So you have to start to plant those seeds when people are not shopping for you. And that's hard. It's expensive. It's challenging. And it's why the big brands can, can compound their advantage because they have the money to do that when you're not shopping for something small brands yeah. it's hard nice nice yeah. you know uh, i usually track how many times you pronounce uh the word brand you know and i lost my track after 10 times <laughs> and we have the topic about marketing but uh yeah we uh, speak a lot about brands can you tell for example you know it's interesting once i watch um presentation of a new apple watch after that uh -huh. i bought three pairs yeah, prepares uh, for me, for my wife, for my son, because they kill me if I uh, buy only for myself. But right, know, that's good. That's a good strategy. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. And it's interesting. After watching this presentation, I got the feeling of owning this Apple Watch because uh, I got the feeling that Apple Watch can simplify my life, decide uh -huh. my problems, many other things. And Tim Cook uh, didn't share features of this Apple Watch. Correct. He shared Three stories, how Apple Watch can help uh, three different people. He explained uh, a lot about this Apple Watch. And after that, I bought three pairs. Can you yes. tell how to create this feeling of owning? It's not like features um, uh, that many other brands can have. It's more about to creating the feeling because 75% uh, of all decisions are emotions. So Correct. any insights about that? Yeah, yeah. In fact, it might be 100% in, 
include emotions and that we just aren't aware of how those emotions affect us. And emotions aren't just the strong feelings. It's just the, the gut instinct or the intuition we have about something. Those are, those are emotional. I think you're right. I think uh, there was a great, I don't know who did it, but someone did a parody ad. Uh, what if Coca-Cola was a B2B brand selling software? Coca-Cola would say something like 78% of consumers find that Coca-Cola quenches their thirst. Mm -hmm. Or they'd say Coca-Cola is made with 42% more sugar than uh, leading other brands. Uh, sugar mm -hmm. is known to cascade to multiple energy benefits, I mean, right? It's, mm -hmm. This is not how Coca-Cola markets and advertises. Yeah. Especially in B2B, we think it's all logic and that people want all the facts and they, they might want some facts at some point, but you're right that even in B2B, but certainly in B2C, people want to feel like this thing will make their life better. And Tim Cook was a great example. Of course, before him, Steve Jobs was a brilliant example of showing how will this product improve your life? If you buy this thing, it's, it's right. It's not about how many megapixels the camera is. It's how will you feel as a filmmaker making mm -hmm. films now? You'll feel great. You'll feel confident. That's the same if you're selling B2B CRM as it is if you're selling watches, consumer electronics, or, or Tito's vodka. You have to tap into what's that positive feeling people will have about themselves and their life if they, if they use this product, the product is just a tool to make their life better. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's talk about, um, crafting this message. Uh, I'm interested about how to write marketing message to consumers because consumers are different. And, uh, 10 years ago, I didn't create a buying persona. I set up all marketing campaigns on Google ads, Facebook ads myself without yep. a, a team of specialists because I paid five, 10 cents per click. Right now I need to pay five, ten dollars, no, hundred times more because of competition. Competitors yes. are willing to pay as well. So it's hard uh, today to get cheap clicks. I mean, like effective clicks. Uh, and uh, can you tell how to create the right message? I mean, like marketing message that uh, catch attention because uh, uh, marketing is everywhere and many yes. customers ignore. It doesn't matter SEO, pay-per-click, social media. Uh, people ignore something that do, they don't need. So can you tell about getting their attention? Yes, uh, I need to reference Paul Feldwick about this. Paul Feldwick is an old marketing strategy guy from uh, England. I forget, or maybe somewhere in the UK, but I believe it's England, but he's written several books. One of which is called, why does the peddler sing? And the peddler is the person at, in the town fair who comes mm -hmm. to sell his you know, rope or comes to sell his eggs. And often those people sing a song and they do it to attract attention and to entertain. And he talks about the long, long, long relationship. I, I mean, thousands of years, the relationship between entertaining and selling and selling and entertaining. And so you see people who want to sell things like the peddler will entertain by handing out lollipops or making, you know, paper hats for people or singing a song. And then on the other hand, we have seen lots and lots of entertainers who said, you know what, I can actually make a lot of money if I start selling things because I'm already famous. So great example is all of the cosmetic brands that are coming out of celebrities. For instance, uh, is it Kendall Jenner? Kylie Jenner? I think it's Kylie Jenner. Mm -hmm. uh, Kylie Jenner has a very successful cosmetic brand and she could do that because she was already an entertainer. She was already entertaining people and famous. So uh, I think a big piece of it is to embrace the entertainment side, as Paul Feldwick would encourage us to do in the advertising, because advertising is a lot less effective as a persuasion tool, and it's much more effective as a tool for 
getting in your mind and making you think of the brand at all and maybe making you like the brand a little bit. I mean, that's what all those, I don't know if you watched any of the Super Bowl ads uh, last month during the, or not even last month, a few weeks ago. Uh, I'm not a fan of that, but yeah. (laughs) But it's it's famous for very big, important celebrity filled ads, very expensive ads. And a lot of those ads, they're really there to just make you feel good about the brand. Because if you feel mm-hmm. good about the brand, then three weeks later, three months later, when you're finally in the market to buy some vodka or buy a CRM service, you're going to be like, oh, yeah, that brand made me feel good. I like, I'll, I already like that brand. Let's look into it. Let's try out Tito's. So uh, a lot of the entertainment stuff is classic entertainment. It's using humor, using things that are cute, using things that are cuddly and fun, dogs, it doesn't sound scientific at all, but put a dog in an ad and it's most likely to do better than your previous ad. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You, rem- you remind me, Jim Edwards, you know, uh, he spoke on my podcast uh-huh. uh, and he wrote a book. Uh, say thank you for everything for to everyone. And he has been working in Business Insider for 10 years. Uh, he started on this company from scratch. Then the company was sold for uh 500 million dollars thousand employees successful company and he told that success depends on creating non-boring content uh the niche finance business boring you know yeah like marketing can be boring any niche can be boring but if you create non-boring content you can win in the end uh and uh, because today we have a lot of educational content valuable yes. content but but it's boring, you know. Yes. For example, many business books are great for sleep. Uh, when yes. I take a new book, I can yes. read and sleep well all night. I don't remember exactly about this book, anything. But um, uh, but I can save money for paying for medicine pills if I have such problems. Can you tell how to create entertainment content? Because uh, most niches don't need entertainment. They need educational content that uh, provides value. But we need to combine entertainment and uh, educational. Any insights about that? Well, it's clear that many people are wrong that they think that that all, you mostly need content that's informative and educational, right? That's That's mm-hmm. the assumption that marketing is about persuading advertising especially is about persuading people your product is better and therefore we need to educate them and that takes you down a certain path and a lot of people who do software and who do companies and our business people are very logical people so they think that marketing and advertising should be logical pursuits but they forget that at the end of the day they turn all that off and they want to watch netflix They want to watch Euphoria. They want to watch Game of Thrones or Better Call Saul. They want to listen to some great music. And why do they like this band versus that band? It's not the magic. I mean, it's not the science. It's the magic. It's the magic of why you love one band and you hate another band or why you love to watch TV or um, Game of Thrones. So so there, there is an assumption, especially in B2B, that you need to educate and you need to persuade. And that means you're not even trying to entertain, much less the fact that entertaining well is really, really hard. Think of how many bad TV shows there are, how many bad movie scripts never even got turned into a movie, which takes me to, I I need to to, uh, really make this point clear. You know about the bell curve, Anatoly? Uh, Yeah. The bell curve, like the, the normal distribution, right? The Gaussian. Yeah, yeah. It's a bell curve and people, human height is a bell curve. So Mm -hmm. some people are very, very short and they can be gymnasts or they can be jockeys. Some people are very, very tall. And of course they should be playing basketball because that's what tall people do. Most of us are in the middle and that's a bell curve. And lots of things in the world are bell curves, but there's another curve. It's called the banana curve and Weimar Mm -hmm. Schneider's really has has made this a thing. And I love that he calls it the banana curve. It's shaped like a banana. And you've got lots of little things and then very, very few big things. And hundreds, if not thousands of things in nature are a banana curve. Uh, Wealth or income is a banana curve. 
most people make very little money. And then you've got the very, very richest people way out here who are super rich. Um, brand size is a banana curve. You've got very many brands who are tiny. Like think of all the very, very small alcohol brands that are local or skincare brands. And then you've got very, very few global brands. So there's a banana curve. This is the same for creativity. There's Most ads are terrible. Most ads don't work. Most ads mm -hmm. are shit because there's lots of them people trying and there's lots of brands doing it. And then you've got a banana curve and then some brands, some ads are good. And then very few ads are remarkable and triple your sales because it's hard. It's hard to do good art. It's hard to make a good song. Um, even with all the tools we have and the AI we have, it's hard. So, um, so that's a, a piece of the puzzle is you have to embrace how hard it can be to do good magic, to do good art. You have to embrace how hard it is to entertain and you have to try to entertain as well. You can't just do all the, 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 the science side and the, the, you know, informative persuasive content side. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Okay. Uh, I'm interested about choosing priorities. You know, uh, I see when uh, people are trying to do a lot, you know, uh, if, uh, for example, if they have limited resources, but uh, marketing is huge, many marketing channels. And when I listen to Gary V show, he always tells you need to post on TikTok, on LinkedIn, on Facebook, uh, on Instagram. But, you know, if you have two hands or uh, limited resources, for me, it's much better to pay attention to specific channels. For example, I remember in 2020, I decided to grow my brand online. What I did, I posted content everywhere. Uh, my best results were like five, 10 followers a day, 100 views. And then I switched all my attention to LinkedIn to get like uh, 200 followers a day, uh, 10,000 views, and I got it. It's much better if you pay attention to specific channel where you can become better than many others than to be jack of all trades. So can you tell how to choose priorities? Because many companies still don't know where, what to do because marketing is huge, especially digital marketing. Yes, yes. Oh, it's a it's a perennial challenge. It's very hard. Um, the, the best metaphor I, I have for that actually comes from my past, which is in ecology. I, I was an ecologist in a past life before I became a marketer and an advertiser. And in ecology, nature, what nature does is nature tries lots and lots of things. Like, uh, you know, you have 10 babies. I don't know. I, I know I don't have 10 kids. I, I don't think you have 10 kids, but let's say you have 10 babies. Or maybe you, you're a spider and you have 500 babies. Those babies are all different types and they have different genes and they have different abilities. And so those get put out in the world and they, they succeed or they fail. And then the ones that succeed, they can continue. Uh, it's the same with bees. Bees are a great example. And I've used them as a metaphor a lot for marketing. Most of the hive goes out and finds the, the, the bushes where all the flowers are and they can go out and exploit that. But some of the bees go off and explore more places. They're not interested in where everyone already is. So they're constantly trying new places because eventually the bees will use up all that pollen on that bush and they're going to need a new bush to get more pollen. The, the term for all of this is called explore and exploit, explore and exploit. So you explore lots of options like you did. You tried all your platforms and you found one or two that you think worked best like LinkedIn and then you exploit you double down and you do that and you use it. You need to keep doing both. You need to find times and ways to explore, to learn, to test and learn, to fail fast. I hate that term. I don't, I don't like I don't, failure is inevitable, but we shouldn't, you know, be celebrating fail fast. I don't know. It just bugs me. So you need to constantly learn and explore, but then you also, once you discover something that works for you, focus and exploit. And it's a balance because things will change, right? You find a marketing tactic that works for the first two years and then it stops working. And then you've got to try something new. Explore and exploit. It's a great strategy. Yeah.
Uh, you're on mute. I I know you were. You had some uh, outdoor. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you you have the privilege of being outside today. Uh, yeah. It looks beautiful there. It's four degrees here in Boulder. It's oh, four, yeah. So I, I will not be <laughs> streaming from outside today. Yeah. Oh, by the way, I I love a cold weather. I don't know it's my nature, but uh, yeah, I can show my view. Uh, for someone who are uh -huh. listening, eh, it's like beautiful day on Florida. <laughs> gorgeous, gorgeous. Yeah, yeah. here it's uh, very snowy. Ah, beautiful, but it, snowy. Got yeah, got it. Okay, let's talk about uh, mistakes. Can you list common mistakes that marketers still do and uh, your tips uh, how to find a much better way? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and we've mentioned a couple already, so I'll just reaffirm those. The first big mistake is assuming that advertising really persuades people that your brand is better. And mostly it doesn't. Advertising mostly lets people know you exist, maybe makes them feel a certain way about your brand, and then reminds them that you are there and that you know maybe someday when you're in the market to buy, you should buy. So that's a big mistake. That, that we assume advertising persuades. Another big mistake is that my buyer is really different from your buyer. That, that let's say a Nike person, a Nike mm. person is really different than an Adidas person. And, and that therefore I go for the Nike attitude. And, oh, un, oh, Under Un Armour. Under Armour, yeah. <laughs> there we go. Yes. So that's a great example. That, that like a Nike person is really different than an Under Armour person. And that I, my goal is to have all Nike loyalists who love Nike and would shit on Under Armour if it was in their house. And you would have the opposite. That's a mistake. That's a big mistake because for most brands and in most categories, people buy several different brands. They switch it up every once in a while to try something new. They might need a change of pace. They like this brand for the, you know, because the jacket works, but they like this brand because the shirt fits. And so most people have several brands. It's called a repertoire of brands. Um, and this again comes from a lot of work from the Ehrenberg Bass Institute in Australia. Uh, Byron Sharp has written a lot about this in his books, How Brands Grow. Um, but uh, that's a big mistake to assume that my buyer is so different than your buyer. And therefore, I need to find people who are mine and own them because what was going to happen is we're going to share them. If Nike, turns out most people, what is it? Nike has like a 50% household penetration in America, which means 180 million Americans or something have Nike in their closet. But there are a lot of other things in their closets too. Yeah. Most people who buy Nike buy occasionally. They only buy a little bit of Nike. They're not Nike loyalists and Nike shares them with Under Armour. So that's another huge mistake is to assume my person is so different and that never the two will meet. Uh, and, and if you make that assumption, then you, you rob yourself of the opportunity of selling to a whole lot of other people because Nike sells to a lot of Under Armour buyers. A lot of un Under Armour people are Nike customers too. So that's a big mistake as well. Mm -hmm. By the way, you know, it's interesting because uh, I think it depends. Uh, for example, uh, for me, I personally uh, pay more attention to quality. You know, Under Armour, Nike, uh, Reebok, it doesn't matter. My son always uh, tells me, you know, he, he always like, please buy new Nike. He doesn't tell me buy new sneakers. He doesn't tell me buy t shirt Nike. Uh -huh. Why Nike? I don't know. Uh -huh. you know. So can you tell how what Nike can do to convince people like my son and many others to buy uh, Nike, not other brands? <laughs> That's hard work. That's very hard to get to the point where people really like your brand so much. That's what they want. And that's what, how they think about it. Like mm -hmm. Nike is one of those uh, extremely successful brands that everybody knows. And we use as an example all the time. Uh, so it's a little hard to sometimes realize they they go to the bathroom just like every other brand. <laughs> they put their mm -hmm. shoes on one foot at a time, just like every other brand. Um, so there are many other brands 
which, uh, and Nike too, where people say, ah, I just need some shoes. And these were on sale at the mall. So I bought them. They happened to be Nike this time. Um, Mm -hmm. But to get to the point where, where people ask for your brand by name, that is, is a little bit of science there for sure. You need to know what people want from the category. You need to know the fundamentals of distribution so that people can actually buy you and find you. You need to uh, make your transactions frictionless so that it's easy for people to give you their money. I, I ditched two purchases this past week because I was so frustrated by trying to buy it on my phone. Their, their you know, interface and their e-commerce was terrible on the phone. I, I left. Two, two stores lost my business because it was hard for me to give them my money when I already knew what I wanted and I was willing to pay for shipping. So mm-hmm. a lot of those are really fundamental and they're the science part and you got to get this right. And then there's the magic part, which is what is, what does Nike do that makes them, makes your son be like, Oh, I want to be. And the thing Nike does of course is associate their brand with the world's best athletes with the people who win more than everyone else, people who have the most grit and are tough and are the most champions, right? That's what Nike. So when your son wants a pair of shoes, he wants to feel that way. And that brand does that. Other brands can do it in their own way. Nike does it by saying, we are creating a permanent relationship between buying a Nike, wearing a Nike, wherever it is, and feeling like a tough champion. (laughs) <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm pretty sure that influence marketing impacts a lot to my son <laughs> because oh, yes. he, yeah, he loves to watch uh, uh, sporting events with great sportsmen. And yeah, they can convince him to buy Nike. Okay. I have the final question. Um, you know, uh, from my personal experience, I, uh, you know, I found that. I usually get much better results with someone who understands SEO. For example, if I have a new client and uh, if I see my client understands SEO, so uh, we can move uh, much faster, much better, get uh, great results because we are working like a cohesive team. Now, uh, it's not like magic that uh, the customer can tell you, please do anything. Uh, and I just want to uh, get all these results. You know, uh, we need to get content together to promote content, ma- many different things. So uh, can you tell, for example, if you started today from scratch without any experience, knowledge, skills, but someone, uh, and but you have a goal to be doctor in one day, to have all these books on your background, to read all these books, to get this experience, what will you do today to learn more about marketing? If I were starting from scratch today, yes, to learn about marketing, yes, correct. I, well, there are so many resources and so many tools. I would listen to your podcasts and I'd listen to you interviewing people who are truly successful and who have learned things along the way. Now, you can't assume that everyone has figured it out exactly the same. So, Gary V has a very different story than, oh, I forget his name, the guy who uh, invented MailChimp. Um, MailChimp? I don't or, remember. <laughs> or uh, I think it's George Zimmer who did Man's Warehouse. Mm-hmm. So every person has a little bit of a different story. So they have different paths, but start by learning from great people, successful people who have built something or who have studied something. So I have not built a big company. My company is tiny. Uh, and yeah. I am I am not a household name and famous, but uh, I have studied the the science of marketing, and I would suggest that people do find ways to learn about the science and the art. For instance, and I will I'll, I'll pull some books. Let's see. Here's okay. one. Um, okay, how brands grow. I mentioned Byron Sharp and the Ehrenberg Bass Institute. This is a classic on the science of marketing, on the laws of nature, just like what holds a building up, the engineering for the building. So that's that's one, that's a good one for science. For art, um, for the art side, I would say uh, 
this is really fun when it comes to marketing alchemy mm-hmm. alchemy yeah. is by Rory Sutherland and he he loves this side of the equation because he deals with a lot of people who want to reduce everything to numbers and and science and he says ah eh, not so fast there is an alchemy a magic in marketing and you can't you can't discount that because that is how some of the great stuff works here's another um here's another one john cleese John Cleese was from Monty Python and he wrote a fish called Wanda and some other great movies. And uh, he's an entertainer, but he has to market himself. He has to, he's a bit of a scientist because he has to test his ideas in the market to see if they're actually funny, but this little book on creativity, amazingly useful. So there are books you can grab. There are podcasts you can listen to Uh, be a sponge. If you're young and new in the market, yeah. Be a sponge and try and equally learn the science, which cuts through a lot of bullshit, and then the magic and and the the parts that are really hard to pin down and put numbers on. Nice. Love it. Love it. Great advice. I, I agree. I love reading books. Uh, for me, books bring more knowledge than blog posts, than any other format, because book offers usually spend like six months, a year to write a book, but uh, for writing article, it takes like a few hours, you know? So yeah, I love reading books, but I don't ignore other formats, podcasts, sure. uh, blog posts, because uh, uh, books usually sh- uh, like foundation of our skills, foundation of uh, human psychology, but uh, other formats share new great ideas, uh, breaking news, uh, what, Uh, things are coming so yeah all formats are great just it's better to combine you know you, yes. uh, between them yeah i agree yeah. love it love it try different things <laughs> try what works for you if you like audio books or podcasts do that if yeah. you prefer a course take an online course with someone uh, mark ritson is uh he has a fantastic thing he calls his mini mba it's brilliant Take that if you have got the time and the money to do it and the, the, you prefer to learn that way. So there are many ways, but the point is to really, you have to be a sponge and then you have to learn how to separate what's true for all brands from what's true for this brand. Because a lot of people do something and they succeed and then they think all brands should be that way. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. Love it. True, love there it. is some stuff that's true for all brands, like the banana curve. But then there's different truths for different brands. So you need to be be able to figure those out. That's what I recommend. Nice, nice. Uh, Dr. Decker, it's a big pleasure to get on my show, to learn from you. Tell our audience the best way how to keep learning from you, how to uh, reach out to you, how to follow you. <laughs> I, uh, I live on 14th and Alpine in Boulder. So you can come by the... I'm joking. Uh, I, uh, I, of course I would be willing to go for coffee anytime. If anyone's in, in Colorado, let me know the easier ways to find me are on the internet. I'm easy to find under Ethan Decker. My company applied brand science is easy to find. The website is applied brand Uh, I post on LinkedIn. I post little articles there, uh, usually under my own account, EH Decker, And I'm on Twitter for now until it, it implodes entirely. But uh, I do tend to tweet a little bit and have conversations on Twitter. So you can find me there at EH Decker as well. Nice, nice. I hope Twitter will be fine. Uh, I don't know. We'll see. Uh, I remember Jeff Bezos once said that Amazon will be bankrupt, you know, because uh Anything is, you know, uh, anything has some uh, the end. So yeah, uh, Twitter will be bankrupt, Google will be, but it takes time. You know? Yeah, you never know. I mean, uh, what was it? MySpace completely collapsed, and then it had a small rebirth in a different form. Tumblr seemed to collapse, but maybe it's coming back as it's as a new thing in a new time. So who knows? Twitter might change. Twitter might go away entirely. For now, it's it's still. I still find it useful and there are still lots of good people on it. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. And you think uh, Elon Musk can help you with that or not? <laughs> <laughs> He, uh, it, it's hard to say he has his own, his own motivations. 
and they're not always right. the same as as what's good for a company or what's good for uh, a group of people. He does nice, what he nice. wants. <laughs> okay, okay, guys. Thanks a lot for listening, watching us. Uh, please reach out to uh, Ethan Decker, you know, on LinkedIn, uh, on his website. You can find all these links in the description below. Listen us on Apple, Google, Spotify, and see you next time. Thank you.